Perhaps it will be different. So, it's a medical facts, medical history video. And what I'm going to do is uh, play around with this, this uh, new concept of layered sounds. I've been subtly putting it in my videos, but thanks, of course, to my uh, my predecessors. You always got to shout out the, the originators. Um, and I don't know where they got it from, but Raffi Taffy with his, his, uh, oh man, I should, I should really have like something better, his little boxes. Maybe I could just pretend it's coming out of my mouth. Sir. Sure. 
set these sounds real quick. sounds pretty good to me. I like that. I really like that. Hope you guys do too. So one of the one of the oldest known medical textbooks is the Sushruta Samhita, written in Sanskrit in India. Its exact date is tentative, but um, no original version survives, and it's only known from its later copies, in fact, but the current consensus is that it was written around 600 BC. Um, Sushruta is thought to have been a physician and a teacher working in the North Indian city of Benares, now Varanasi, in the state of Uttar, Uttar Pradesh. His Samhita, a compilation of knowledge, provides detailed information on medicine, surgery, pharmacology, and patient, patient management, patient management. Uh, so, Sushruta advises his students that however well read they are, they are not competent to treat disease until they have practical experience, which is a practical practically brilliant piece of advice. Surgical incisions were to be dried out on the skin of fruits while carefully extracting fruit seeds enabled the students to develop the skill of removing foreign bodies from flesh. They also practiced on dead animals and uh, leather bags filled with water before being let loose let loose on real patients. Among its many surgical descriptions, the Sushrutu Samhita documents, it actually documents cataract surgery. The patient had to look at the tip of his or her nose while the surgeon, holding the eyelids apart with uh, a thumb, and uh, index finger used a needle-like instrument to pierce the eyeball from the side. It was then sprinkled with breast milk, so it was then sprinkled with breast milk, and the outside of the eye bathed 
with an herbal medication. The surgeon used the instrument to scrape out the clouded lens until the eye assumed the glossiness of a resplendent, cloudless sun. And during the recovery, it was important for the patient to avoid coughing, sneezing, of course, burping, or anything else that might cause the eye pressure to increase. If the operation was a success, the patient would regain actually some useful vision, albeit unfocused. So this next one is a tree of life, actually tackled scurvy, a tree of life. I hope you guys like hand movements, because I really do, too. Um, trapped in near ice, in ice, near, sorry, that would be water, I suppose. Trapped in ice near Staticona, the site of present-day Quebec City, in 1536, Shock Cartiers. Uh, Cartier is probably a French. His ships weren't going anywhere. The crews hole up in a makeshift fort with little access to food, and uh, fresh food at least came down with disease so gruesome that their mouth actually became stinking and their gums so rotten. Um, it's a little bit, uh, you know, explicit, but basically it's just the, the flesh became rotten and so it started to fall off, and um, even the roots of the teeth started being exposed and, um, and, and it said most of those teeth almost did fall out. What they had was scurvy, now known to be the result of a deficiency from vitamin C. Um, of course, Cartier had no, Cartier had no idea what to do during his first voyage to Staticona. In 1534, he had kidnapped two young men, Dom Agaya and Ty... Ty... Um, Ty... Noni, Ty... Noni. Ty... Noni. There's two silent G's there. Outcast. Spelled like sign, the G-N. Anyways, I'm going with Ty... Noni. Uh, taking them back to France as proof that he had discovered a new territory. So they must have been Inuit or Eskimos or some Native Americans. Now that they were home, the men and their community, of course, had every reason not to trust Cartier. Cartier, an attitude that he interpreted as a treachery or knavery. In spite of this tension, though, Dom Agaya showed Cartier. Cardi I got a I gotta land on a consistent pronunciation. Cartier. How to make a a de decoction from a tree called Aneta. A N N E D D A. And although the Frenchman wondered if it were a plot to poison them, a couple of them gave it a go and were actually cured within a few days. So after that, there was such a rush for the medicine that they were ready to kill one another, one another for it and used up the whole large tree. The identity of Ananetta, Ananetta, sorry, is not certain, but there are ser several candidates, including eastern white cedar and white spruce. Whatever it was, its nutritional benefits result, resulted in the sailor's complete cure. Cartier repaid Damagaya by kidnapping him again, along with nine other people. By the time of Cartier's next voyage to Canada, um, five years later, in 1541, most of the prisoners were actually dead, but Cartier informed their relatives that they were living in style in France. The scurvy cure did not gain widespread recognition, and the disease continued to claim the lives of sailors for more than 200 years. So, clearly the 
personality uh, it, it, the disagreeable and close-minded personality it takes to captain a ship and be disciplined enough doesn't wasn't sufficiently sophisticated to account for new possibly life changing possibly civilization changing discoveries and outside useful information he let his ego and his tribalism get in the way of what would have clearly saved hundreds thousands of lives so any good uh, plastic surgeon at least from the television the extensive television i watched on it so clearly i'm an expert always uses a, a marker a marker to uh, highlight the potential patterns for cutting that he will later use Sounds pretty darn good. Let's let's let that ride out, play out, loop. So our next one is if you want a cure for everything, try theriac. I've never actually heard of that word. I hope I'm pronouncing it right. Being a being a king in ancient times was exhaustingly dangerous. <laughs> there was always someone plotting to get rid of you. So according to legend, Mithred, Mithridates, aka Mithridates the sixth of Pontus on the shores of the Black Sea in Turkey. So a very ancient, a very ancient region. Attempted to become resistant to poisons by taking gradually increasing doses of them. Okay. So it's like, um, it's not homeopathy, but but it's clearly like um, the equivalent of getting a shot or a flu shot. Of course, you don't know if you have the right strain you're being injected with, but if you granted that it is the same strain you're trying to avoid, um, that you think you'll come in contact with, you're actually being injected with low doses, very, very low doses, very diluted doses of, um, of the actual disease itself so that your antibodies can um, effectively combat it. You can, they can evolve a, a defense against them and now that you've been exposed to that, your antibodies, uh, your, your, your white blood cells, I think it is, um, once they've had the opportunity to fight it and develop their own solution. They can wipe it clean if it's ever introduced because it, uh, they have a template for creating that. It's a, the human body is seriously a mystery. It's so fascinating how complex biological organisms really are. So he was also reputed to have conducted toxicological experiments on condemned prisoners culminating in the creation of Mithridate, a medicine that combined all known antidotes into one potent formula. It didn't work against Roman armies, but when Mithridate 
Greece was defeated by the military leader Pompey in 66 BC. The recipe supposedly arrived in Rome. Emperor Nero's physician Andromachus developed it into a 64 ingredient composition which became known as theriac. And most of the ingredients were botanical, including opium. But viper's flesh was a notable component. In spite of early skepticism, theriac took off as a prized and expansive um, expensive, I don't know why I saw that, cure, uh, cure-all. By the 12th century, Venice was the leading exporter of the substance and had a high profile in European, Arabic, and Chinese medicines alike. Wow, that's a seriously interesting fact. Uh, wow, I honestly did not know that. So its fortunes waned. However, in uh, around 1745, which, you know, 15 plus hundred years is still a pretty good run, when William Herberden debunked its alleged efficacy and suggested that the enterprising Romans had exaggerated the Mithridates story for their own gain. So even so, Theriac remained in some European pharmacopias until the late 1800s, 19th century. Wow, that's so interesting. Okay, let's uh, let's go ahead before our next fact and uh, fade out the marker cap sounds. Even though I really like that. Um, this next one involves general anesthesia, helping cancer patients at the beginning of the 19th century. And you know one thing that you always want to be under anesthesia before having done to you is getting getting snipped. Studied medicine and 
Kyoto and set up a practice in his hometown of Hirayama. He became interested in the idea of anesthesia, um, owing to stories that a third century Chinese surgeon, Hua Do, had developed a compound drug enabling patients to actually sleep through the pain. Hiraoka experimented with similar formulae and produced what's called Susan-san, 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 a potential hot drink, a potential hot drink, among other botanical ingredients. It contained the plant Tachira Mateo, or the Devil's Trumpet, Devil's Trumpet, uh, Mongshud, and Angelica de Cursiva, all of which some potent physiologically active substances substances suits and son suits and son had a quite uh, had quite a kick if you uh, glued it down willy-nilly um, sorry glugged it down willy-nilly and you would probably die but in the correct dosage of course and um, rendered by a professional somewhat experienced at least it actually rendered patients unconscious for between six and 24 hours which is of course ample time for amputating so um, in 1804 Hanoka Hanoka excised Ganaya's tumor while she was under general anesthesia. Anesthesia, 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 going on to operate on at least 150 more breast cancer patients and, uh, and of course, other people with other serious, um, uh, conditions that required operation. Sadly, Kanaya is thought to have died of her disease the following year, but, but had been spared the agony that still characterized surgery in the West. So, uh, there was actually a leech craze. Um, I actually knew about this vaguely. Um, I've at least heard of it um, in 19th century Europe, which is the the 1800s. The medicinal leech has been used for thousands of years, and is even today considered to be a way of restoring venous circulation. Venous circulation after reconstructive surgery, but it was in the early 19th century that the leech really soared in popularity. No pun intended, apparently. Led by French physician Francois Joseph Victor Broussard, Broussard, 1822-ish, who postulated that all disease stemmed from local inflammation treatable by bloodletting. The leech craze saw barrels of these creatures shipped across the globe. Wild leech populations decimated almost to extinction and the establishment of prosperous leech farms. Leeches, uh, they had advantages over the common practice of bloodletting using a lancet which is uh, the loss of blood was more gradual and less of a shock for those of delicate constitution. And because Broussais' followers used leeches in place of all other medicines, patients were spared some harsh remedies that uh, might otherwise have made them feel worse. Uh, British surgeon called Ray Rees Price coined the term sanguine 
suction for leech therapy. Sangui meaning blood, generally. Um, okay. Okay, I think that's just enough for uh, the scissor sounds. I'm going to go on to my last trigger here, and uh, I hope you guys enjoy it. So, last fact and last trigger. last trigger is one of my favorites. It is actually, um, it hasn't made its, uh, reappearance since, uh, I think, god, I think one of my Jordan Peterson episodes, like, six months ago. So, uh, yeah, I hope you guys enjoy this huge envelope.
successful operation that he had witnessed in the African Kingdom of Bunyoro Kitara five years earlier. The operation Falcon reported was carried out with the intention of saving both lives. So it wasn't just a whim, it wasn't just a uh, accident or coincidence that uh, the mother was also saved. The mother was partially anesthetized with uh, banana wine. The surgeon also used this wine to wash the surgical site and his own hands, suggesting the awareness of the need for infection control measures. Infection. He then made a vertical incision going through the abdominal wall and part of the uterine. before further dividing the uterine wall enough to take the baby out. The operation also involved removing the placenta and squeezing the uterus to promote contraction. The means of the dressing of dressing the incision was also highly developed. Uh, the surgeon used seven polished iron spikes to bring the edges of the wound together them in place with a bark cloth string. He then applied a thick layer of herbal paste and covered this with a warm banana leaf held in place by a bandage. According to Falcon's account, the mother and her baby were still doing well when he left the village 11 days, almost two weeks later. Um, although cesarean operations had been performed in Africa, by white surgeons before this date, the procedure appeared to have been developed independently um, by the Banyuro, Banyuro people, a somewhat discomforting realization for a British audience familiar with colonial tales of savages. So, um, yeah, I really, I really enjoyed all this. This was really fascinating. Let me know.